The cardiovascular system circulates blood throughout the body. It can have its own diseases. It can also supply disease material to other systems in the body, causing other systemic diseases. The cardiovascular system is a closed system. This means there is no normal flora in the cardiovascular system. The heart pumps the blood into the arteries. The blood is distributed through the capillaries, picked up by the veins, and returned back to the heart. The blood is supposed to carry materials to and from the cells. This can include bacteria and bacterial toxins. The lymphatic system collects the lymph from the tissues. Lymph, remember, is the fluid that's left after bulk flow. Fluid flows out of the blood into the tissues. Most of the fluid returns to the blood, but some is left behind. That fluid always has to be returned to the blood. There is no pump on the lymphatic system. It's a one-way flow from the tissues back to the heart. But along the way, the lymph is filtered by the lymph nodes. You will remember that this is important in immune system surveillance and immune system function. Neither the lymphatic system or the cardiovascular system has any normal flora. Septicemia is the presence of microbial infection in the blood causing illness. Bacteremia literally means bacteria in the blood. Some people use bacteremia and septicemia interchangeably, but it is possible to have bacteremia, transient bacteremia, where the bacteria are in the blood only for a few moments, your white blood cells take it out, and there is no disease. Every time you brush your teeth, you put a few bacteria in your bloodstream. When you defecate, when you urinate, you may put a few bacteria in your bloodstream. Your white blood cells immediately remove those bacteria and there is no problem. Toxemia occurs when there are toxins circulating in the blood. The bacteria producing the toxins can be in one location in the body producing the toxins and releasing those toxins to the bloodstream. Lymphangitis is when you have inflamed lymphatic vessels. These will show through the skin as the red streaks that run from the site of infection to the nearest lymph nodes. Septicemia typically presents with fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, and a feeling of doom. This can progress to septic shock or low blood pressure due to vasodilation. Septicemia can also trigger petechiae, those small blood vessel ruptures under the skin. The bacteria in the blood can invade the bone. This causes osteomyelitis. The signs and symptoms of toxemia will depend upon the toxin in the blood. Gram-positive organisms produce exotoxins. These are usually cell-specific. They're cytotoxins that kill cells or neurotoxins that do nerve damage. Gram-negative cells tend to release endotoxins. These toxins are nonspecific. They cause fever, malaise, and they're the most likely to produce vascular shock and disseminated intravascular coagulation. Staphylococcal infections can release toxic shock toxin. Other organisms can produce toxic shock-like toxin. Both of these lead to a drop in blood pressure and organ failure. Numerous bacteria can get into the bloodstream. The most common bacteria that causes septicemia or toxemia are opportunistic organisms and normal flora. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is an opportunist. It's a gram-negative bacillus. Neisseria meningitidis, a gram-negative coccus. E. coli and salmonella are both gram-negative bacilli that are found in the intestine. Salmonella is usually not present. It's there as an invader, but E. coli is always present. Staphylococcus aureus and Streptococcus pneumoniae can both be normal flora. They're gram-positive cocci. And Streptococcus pyogenes is one of the organisms that can cause a toxic shock-like syndrome. This is also a gram-positive coccus. In order for septicemia to start, the bacteria have to enter the bloodstream somehow. This can be as the result of prolonged intravenous treatment, surgical wounds, invasive procedures, people are on dialysis for long periods of time, even infected teeth. Usually, the immunosuppressed are the ones that are most susceptible to septicemia. They can be immunosuppressed by age, the very young and the very old. They can have AIDS or they can be on chemotherapy. Gram-negative bacteria are the most likely organisms to cause complications of septicemia. Because they release the endotoxin, and this endotoxin stimulates the release of several different cytokines from your immune cells. Tumor necrosis factor can cause extensive tissue damage and also acts as the pyrogen. 
Interleukin-1 causes the release of immature white blood cells from the bone marrow. These cells will actually damage normal cells. Interleukin-6 and interleukin-8 can be responsible for massive vasodilation leading to vascular shock and also can do extensive blood vessel damage leading to hemorrhage. Endotoxins can also activate system-wide blood clotting. This is known as disseminated intravascular coagulation. There are no functional clots formed anywhere in the body, but the clotting factors are used consistently throughout the body. Should you need a clot, you do not have clotting factors to make the clot. These people can bleed out very quickly. Aggressive treatment with antibiotics early in septicemia is very important. If the septicemia is caused by gram-negative bacteria, if you treat too late in the disease, you can release too much endotoxin and actually do more damage than good. Endocarditis is an inflammation of the endocardium of the heart. It can be acute with a rapid onset and sudden symptoms, or it can be subacute with very slow onset and very subtle symptoms. The bacteria invade the tissue of the heart, the endocarditis, and they develop vegetations. These vegetations are masses of platelets and clotting factors that surround and bury the bacteria. This effectively hides the organisms from the immune system. The vegetations, however, can break off and get into the bloodstream. They become emboli. Endocarditis usually prevents with fever, fatigue, tachycardia, and heart murmurs. The mitral valve and the aortic valve are the most frequently involved valves in endocarditis. Usually, endocarditis is caused by viridan streptococci, that normal throat flora. Other opportunistic organisms can be involved, but typically viridan streptococci is your causative agent. The people at risk for endocarditis are IV drug users and people who have damaged heart valves or abnormal hearts from some sort of congenital condition. People with damaged heart valves may have had rheumatic fever as children. That could be one of the things that damages their valves. Also people with artificial valves are at risk for endocarditis. Treatment is intravenous antibacterial drugs based on whatever organism is causing the endocarditis. People who have damaged valves or abnormal hearts should take penicillin prophylactically before dental procedures. Also, good dental hygiene is critical, particularly if you have any kind of heart problem, because this organism typically comes from your mouth. Brucellosis is a zoonosis. It's caused by the organism Brucella melantensis. There are several subspecies of Brucella that may be involved as well. This is a fastidious, gram-negative cacobacillus. Fastidious means it's not easy to grow. It causes Bangs disease in cattle. In humans, it causes something known as Malta fever or undulant fever. It got the name undulant fever because the fever comes and goes. It tends to spike every afternoon, and then the fever will drop to normal, and then the next afternoon it will spike again. This is typically transmitted through either unpasteurized dairy products, including goat milk products, or contact with animal body fluids that are contaminated with the organism. People who work in slaughterhouses are at risk, for example. This is one of those organisms that gets ingested by phagocytes, but the phagocyte don't destroy it. So this organism lives on in the phagocytic cells. The disease is usually mild. If treated, it's typically multiple antibiotics over several weeks, but some people have the disease and don't really seek treatment for it. Prevention is by vaccination of animals to prevent the disease from being in the animals at all and to make sure that if you're ingesting any kind of dairy product that it's been pasteurized. Tularemia is another zoonosis. It's caused by the organism Francisella tularensis, another fastidious gram-negative cacobacillus. This is sometimes called rabbit fever. People with rabbit fever will notice a little sore. They'll get swollen lymph nodes, fever, chills, become short of breath, and will experience joint stiffness. The joint stiffness may persist even after they have been treated for the disease. This is an intracellular parasite of animals. It can penetrate unbroken skin. That's what's so dangerous about this one. It can be transmitted through a tick bite or through direct contact with the infected animal meat or with aerosols. Some people, when they feel to dress their kill, they sort of pull the skin off, creating an aerosol. That aerosol can carry the organism if the animal is infected. 
There is a vaccine available, but it's not totally effective. The best prevention is to avoid contact with these animals if possible. Treatment is using streptomycin or gentamicin. These are very effective against the organism, but both of these drugs are a little bit toxic to humans. Bubonic plague has been called the Black Death. It's caused by Yersinia pestis, which is a gram-negative bacillus that's found in a number of animals. There were two major pandemics. The one in the 1400s killed one-third of the population of Europe in five years. The disease has two manifestations, bubonic plague and pneumonic plague. In bubonic plague, the organism is spread from the rodent that harbors the organism to the human via a flea bite. The organism becomes trapped in the lymph nodes, and the lymph nodes swell, leading to these swollen areas known as buboes. This is where the disease got its name, bubonic plague. Disseminated intravascular coagulation can occur with this disease, but what most likely occurs is necrosis of the tissues, and as the tissues die, the skin turns black. This is where it got the name Black Death. In pneumonic plague, the organism spreads from the bloodstream to the lungs of the infected individual. It can then be spread human to human via the air. The lungs are rapidly damaged in this disease. In our normal situation, this organism should stay in the animal population where it's transmitted animal to animal by fleas. If the flea happens to bite a human, or if we have direct contact with the animal, the organism gets into the bloodstream, the lymph node becomes infected, and you get the bubo, you start getting necrosis of tissue. However, if the organism gets into the lungs, we then have airborne transmission, that is pneumonic plague. Prevention is to control the rodent population. Treatment of bubonic plague must be rapid. If untreated, about 50% of the population will die of bubonic plague, 100% will die of pneumonic plague. Streptomycin and gentamicin, both somewhat toxic drugs, are effective in treating this disease. Lyme disease is another zoonosis. It's spread by ticks. The organism that causes Lyme disease is Borrelia burgdorferi. This is a spirochete. You'll remember we don't talk about gram stain reactions on spirochetes because they're so delicate they don't gram stain well. These are the little spiral shaped organisms that are best demonstrated using dark field microscopy. Borrelia is primarily found in the deer population and spread by the tick of the genus Ixodes, sometimes known as the deer tick. The most noticeable symptom of the disease is a red bullseye type rash that comes from the area where the tick bite was found. Neurological and cardiac symptoms can follow, as can arthritis. Some of these will be irreversible even after the disease has been treated. Treatment is with various tetracycline and penicillin type drugs which are quite effective against the disease. Prevention is vigilance concerning ticks. There is some evidence that Lyme disease is transmitted only by prolonged exposure to the tick, maybe as long as 72 hours. However, using pesticides that repel ticks whenever you're in the woods are a good thing to do if you want to avoid Lyme disease. Ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis are emerging tick-borne diseases. These are also zoonoses. We call them emerging because they were not seen before 1987. These are caused by rickettsias, Ehrlichia chafiensis and Anaplasma phagocytophyllum. These are both gram-negative pleomorphic intracellular parasites. They live and grow in blood cells. The diseases present with flu-like symptoms. Treatment is with doxycycline. Treatment must be immediate because there are complications and fairly high mortality rates if these diseases go untreated. Prevention is avoiding ticks again, using tick repellents when you're out in the woods, for example. Infectious mononucleosis, sometimes called the kissing disease or mono, is caused by human herpes virus 4, better known as Epstein-Barr virus. This is a DNA-containing virus. This virus infects B cells. It suppresses apoptosis of the cell and gives the cell a type of immortality. Epstein-Barr virus has been linked to Burkitt's lymphoma, which is seen in young African males that have been exposed to malaria. Here, the lymph nodes in the cervical region expand and become cancerous. Epstein-Barr virus may also be linked to chronic fatigue syndrome, 
B-cell lymphoma and possibly to oral hairy leukoplakia. About 95% of Americans over the age of 30 have antibodies to Epstein-Barr virus, even though they may not have had the disease. The disease presents with a severe sore throat and fever, enlarged lymph nodes, and fatigue. The fatigue may last for months. This is spread through saliva, so prevention is almost impossible. Treatment is primarily to relieve the symptoms. Since this is a viral disease, antibiotics really don't work. Most people recover from the majority of the symptoms within two to four weeks on their own, but the fatigue may persist for several weeks. Cytomegalovirus is another herpes virus, so it's another DNA-containing virus. Cytomegalovirus disease can result either as an initial contact with the virus or as a latent virus. Since this is a DNA virus, it demonstrates latency. People may pick up the virus, not show any symptoms, but later on may have the disease show up. Most people who get cytomegalovirus are asymptomatic. However, fetuses, newborns, and the immunosuppressed population is susceptible to complications from cytomegalovirus. These complications include an enlarged liver, spleen, and jaundice. Also, cytomegalovirus is a teratogen. In pregnant women, it can cross the placenta and cause malformations of the fetus. Cytomegalovirus is in all body secretions. However, it appears to take a large exchange or very intimate contact in order to transmit the disease. It can be transmitted to the fetus in the birth canal, which is why newborns are at risk. It can be transmitted through blood transfusions and organ transplants. There is no real cure for cytomegalovirus. There are several antiviral drugs that can be used to slow replication. Prevention is primarily practicing safe sex since the primary way that this virus is spread is through sexual contact. Yellow fever is caused by a flavivirus. This is an RNA virus. Yellow fever initially came to the United States in the 1600s through slave ships. Over the years, there have been several large epidemics. It was the digging of the Panama Canal in 1901 that led to the discovery of the cause and prevention of yellow fever. At that time, America was shipping people to the Panama Canal to dig the canal. It was said that they were shipping more people back with yellow fever than they could ship to dig the Panama Canal. Dr. Walter Reed is credited with discovering the cause of yellow fever. In stage one of yellow fever, there's a slight fever. In stage two, there is a period of remission. About 15% of the people who get yellow fever progress to stage three. This is the most serious stage with delirium, coma, liver damage, and hemorrhage. These people may actually vomit blood, and because of the severe liver damage, they get cirrhosis. This is why yellow fever was sometimes called yellow jack. Transmission is through the bite of the Aedes aegypti eye mosquito. The treatment is primarily supportive care. It's a viral disease and there are no antivirals that effectively treat this. Prevention is through mosquito control and we now have a vaccine available. Dengue fever is also caused by a flavivirus, another RNA virus. There are four distinct viruses that cause this disease. So far, dengue fever has only been seen in the Florida Keys and in parts of Texas. Dengue fever presents with fever, weakness, edema, and severe pain. The severe pain gives it one of its names, breakbone fever. There's a 24-hour remission, and then there's a return of fever and rash. Usually, the disease is self-limiting and lasts for only about a week. Dengue hemorrhagic fever is a hyperimmune response following a reinfection. Now, once you're infected with one of the four viruses, you're immune for life. But if you get reinfected with a different virus, you may experience dengue hemorrhagic fever. Here, blood vessels are ruptured and there's internal bleeding and possible death. Supportive treatment is typically all that is provided. The disease is usually mild with the exception of the severe pain. The individual will be immune to that particular virus after surviving the fever. Prevention is through mosquito control. The African viral hemorrhagic fevers are Ebola and Marburg. These are emerging diseases. They're caused by filoviridae, which are RNA viruses. 
Here you see fever, fatigue, dizziness, petechiae may occur, there is internal hemorrhaging and bleeding, and death is usually from shock, seizures, or kidney damage. This is an acute disease, there is no carrier state. With Ebola, the symptoms take 2 to 21 days to emerge. With Marburg, the symptoms occur in 5 to 10 days. Ebola is 90% fatal. Marburg is 25% fatal. The transmission is unclear, probably through contact with the natural host, which is thought to be bats. Once humans have it, they can transmit it to other humans via body fluids, particularly blood. The treatment is primarily supportive treatment, replacing fluids. Prevention is unclear. Since transmission is unclear, it's difficult to know what we should avoid. Of course, once you're dealing with a human that has one of the hemorrhagic fevers, you want to be very careful handling any of the body fluids. Malaria is a protozoan disease. It's caused by a sporozoa, and you'll remember the sporozoa have no means of motility. Malaria is seen in the tropics and the subtropics. There are four species of the protozoa plasmodium that cause malaria. This disease is transmitted via an insect bite. Here it's the Anopheles mosquito. In this case, the mosquito is a biological vector. Part of the malarial life cycle actually goes on inside the mosquito. Once the mosquito inserts the organism into humans, the parasite goes to the liver. Then it infects blood cells. Liver damage and hemolysis of red blood cells are what causes the symptoms of the disease. Certain abnormal hemoglobins, like hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C, and certain genetic deficiencies, like glucose 6-phosphate deficiency or an absence of the Duffy antigen on the red blood cell, are actually protective. Malarial organisms will not infect those red blood cells. Treatment is supportive measures. There's not really anything you can do to treat malaria. Prevention is through mosquito control. Individuals who are going into countries where malaria is endemic are given prophylactic drugs, but there are some side effects of the drugs and some people quit taking them after a while. Toxoplasmosis is another sporozoan disease caused by a protozoa, in this case Toxoplasma gondii. In most individuals, this is a mild flu-like disease or may even be asymptomatic, but it's a major disease in people with AIDS and in unborn children. This is normally a parasite between felines and rodents. Felines eat infected meat, they shed spores in their feces, the rodents eat the spores, their meat becomes infective, and we just go on and on. And this is the normal life cycle for this particular organism. Humans become an accidental host. They either ingest spores while handling infected cat feces. Now, this is pretty rare because cats are only infective briefly if they have this disease. Or more commonly, they get it through eating infected, undercooked meat. The treatment, which is given only to people with AIDS and women who are pregnant, is pyrimethamine and sulfonamides for three to four weeks. Treating pregnant women is controversial because both of these drugs are somewhat toxic. Prevention, it's kind of difficult because many animals are infected, so one thing is to always eat well-cooked meat. You should always wash fruits and vegetables that may be contaminated with soil, particularly soil that may be infected with cat feces. Chagas disease is caused by Trypanosoma cruzi. This is a protozoa that has flagella. This is seen in South and Central America. It's spread by the bite of the triatoma bug, which is called the kissing bug. This is a bug that actually sucks blood. It bites around the mouth, and while it is sucking blood, it defecates. The insect bite is, of course, itchy, so when people scratch, they transfer the parasite from the skin into the bloodstream. Usually the triatoma bites at night. Once the organism enters the bloodstream, it tends to float around in the bloodstream for a short period of time and then it settles either in the heart or in the smooth muscle of the colon. As it settles in there, it does long-term damage to those muscles. Treatment is effective only if treatment occurs early. There are several antiparasitics that will treat this particular organism. However, only about 1% of the cases are diagnosed early enough for treatment to occur. 20 or 30 years later, these people have either heart conditions or something called megacolon, where their colon will not respond as it should. 
In the countries where this disease is prevalent, one of the preventive techniques has been to replace mud and thatch huts with brick and concrete type housing. Also the use of insecticides to try to eliminate the organism and using netting when sleeping so the organism can't get to you while you're asleep. Schistosomiasis is caused by a parasitic worm, a fluke in the genus Schistosoma. There are three different species of this particular worm. This particular disease is geographically limited. It is endemic in Asia, South America, and Africa. The larvae that cause this disease live in fresh water. They burrow through the skin of the human, travel in the blood to various blood vessels in the liver or the urinary bladder. This is species dependent. The female will then burrow through the blood vessel into the nearest body cavity and deposit eggs. For those that live in the blood vessels of the liver, the nearest body cavity is the intestine. For those that live in the blood vessels of the urinary bladder, the nearest body cavity is the urinary bladder. The eggs are then shed in either feces or urine. The eggs hatch in the environment. They infect a snail. The snail then sheds the infective larvae. Treatment is praziquantel, which is an antiparasitic drug. The prevention is better sanitation. Most places where you see schistosomiasis, you have people that are bathing in the river, they're washing their clothes in the river, so they have a lot of water contact. There also tend to be very poor sanitation, and this is why the feces and the urine get into the water and continually reinfect snails, and we have a nice population of larvae to continually reinfect humans.